Take it away. Awesome. Thanks. Hi guys, my name is Patrick. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Uh, for our final project, um, I was working with Natalie and Ajit on um, a uh, trading platform on Ethereum. Uh, we call it Spritzel. And um, we're really excited about building on Ethereum because uh, it makes it really easy for people to create and trade financial instruments that are settled through the blockchain. So uh, that's our, our, our GitHub right here and um, our team. Um, and we are going to get right into a quick demo. So what I'm going to show you here is um, you know, a really easy way to create a, a contract, um, which is a financial instrument that we've created on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so this is a contract for one barrel of uh, Brent crude oil as the underlying asset. And as you can see here, as blocks are being mined, the, the price of the underlying asset is being updated. Um, this is coming <laughs> from a, uh, a, a trusted oracle. And you know, really all you need to trade this contract is um, a trusted oracle that provides a trusted price feed for your underlying asset. Um, we have a couple of examples here, but you can really trade any asset that you like. So let's go ahead and create the contract. Okay, so it's been deployed to the blockchain. Um, we can see here the contract price is 100 Ether, 100.47 Ether. Uh, I can offer this contract, so I can take one side of this contract. I'm logged in as a Jeet. So Jeet's going to take the, um, the sell side of this contract. He's selling the contract. And once this um, uh, offer gets deployed to the blockchain, um, we're going to log in as another user and we're going to take the, the buy side. So we see here seller is Ajit. Uh, he, was at, he was required to post 25 Ether collateral to this contract. So there's 25 Ether locked up in the contract right now as collateral. So, so this collateral cannot be withdrawn by, by anybody until the contract is settled. And um, we're going to go ahead and log in as myself here as Patrick. And Patrick is going to take the buy side of this contract. So Patrick's buying the contract. Uh, and he's, he's also going to be charged. Um, a certain amount of ether, which is going to be approximately 25 ether, but it, it depends on the price of the underlying at the time. All right, so um, so so the contract has been um, uh, bought, and so it's now off the market. It's been purchased, and uh, in a few seconds, it's going to settle. This was a uh, contract with a 60 second expir expiration time, uh, and it just expired. So we have now the option to settle. Uh, we can see here the profit and loss for both sides, and as soon as we settle the contract. Uh, the contract returned the collateral to uh, both the buyer and the seller, minus slash plus their profit and loss. So Ajit got an extra 11 Ether uh, that came out of Patrick's balance. So Patrick got his collateral back minus the 11 Ether. Um, so the contract has now been settled. Um, obviously the, the, um, the prices shown here were randomly generated. Um, these weren't real prices for this demo. But um, you could just as well a, a plug in a, a, an actual price feed from a real underlying asset and you, you, you can um, create those types of trades on the blockchain very easily. So we think this has applications in the um, uh, existing financial world because there are um, certain, certain problems with the current financial system uh, as, as it exists today. So for example, uh, to, to settle those types of trades can take a long time, typically uh, T plus three, so it takes about three days to settle a trade. Uh, in the current financial system if you trade equities, for example. Um, it's also difficult to trade across borders. Uh, there are um, you know, certain countries like China, for example, uh, from where it's very difficult to trade uh, in foreign markets. So um, by making these types of contracts available on the blockchain, you're giving now uh, users uh, across the globe access to the blockchain to uh, get exposure to a wide variety of asset classes and assets that they normally wouldn't be able to access at all. Um, you don't have to trade in standardized instruments like you do on exchanges today. You can create your own instruments. Uh, so for example, you can create a contract that is just based on a fraction of a barrel of oil. So if a trader doesn't want to buy a whole barrel, um, you know, you, you can create a, a, a non-standard contract that, that's, that's a much small, smaller denomination than existing contracts. You can create contracts that are based on uh, private equity, for example. You, you, you can create you can, you can create contracts that are based on any underlying asset that you can uh, get a, a price a price feed for that both parties agree on. Um, in, in the existing system, you have uh, tr transaction fees and you have a lot of intermediaries as well. And so this is kind of a way to disintermediate um, a lot of the existing players and kind of bring everything into a more um, unified system uh, that requires fewer players because in, instead of trusting a few large intermediaries, you can push some of the trust into the blockchain and um, that you know, re reduces the friction and um, re reduces the settlement time and reduces the, the transaction costs for, for the end users. Um, so yeah, our, um, 
our, our settlement time is um, much faster on Ethereum. Uh, the, the block time on Ethereum is 12 seconds. Uh, typically, it takes three days to settle a, a transaction, but here you, you can settle instantaneously with, within one block, as, as we showed you earlier just now. Uh, we showed you a contract that the, the whole life of the contract was only 60 seconds. Um, and um, in, in this example that we showed you here, uh, both parties were asked to post collateral. So even though there was no exchange in the middle, you, you still had limited counterparty risk. So t typically, you would either have to trade through an exchange, which assumes the counterparty risk for you, or you have to trade over the counter, in which case, you're exposed to the counterparty risk. You're exposed to the other person not paying you. But here, in this case, we've actually created an instrument where you don't have to go through an exchange. So you don't have to play by the rules of the exchange. And you, you still limited the counterparty risk because the contract collateralized um, the, the, the underlying asset. And th this is actually something that, without blockchain technology, was previously not, not possible to, to do. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's um, you know, so through technologies like this, you, you, can, you can eliminate the need for many intermediaries like brokers, custodians, clearing houses, uh, registrars uh, that, that are currently involved in, in the financial system. Um, so yeah, uh, questions, Chris? Uh, what are spritzel tokens? Spritzel tokens? So, so one way you can trade here, obviously, we, we showed you a trade that was, that was settled in Ether, uh, but you don't have to settle in Ether, right? I mean, you, you could just as well issue a token, uh, for example, right? So let's say that you wanted to uh, collateralize your, uh, your contract with, uh, with an underlying asset, uh, or let's say you wanted to settle your contract in an underlying asset. Uh, one way you can do that is you can have a trusted custodian that holds the, the actual asset. Let's say you wanted to have a share of Apple, you can have a trusted custodian that both parties trust that holds the share and issues a token on the blockchain. And that can then be, be held, for example, that, that token can then be held as collateral in the contract and can be delivered when the contract ends, just, just like a normal future. Yes? Um, I don't understand financial markets very well. And in the demo, was there, um, is the ownership of the underlying commodity part of the Ethereum contract? Was it tracked by? So, okay, so, so the question is, is the underlying asset uh, tracked on Ethereum? So the contract that we showed you today is a, what's called a non-deliverable contract. So we're actually not delivering the underlying. Uh, instead, what we're doing is, so in this case, the, what the contract was, was that Ajit made a contract with, with Patrick that says, Patrick's going to buy a barrel of oil from Ajit in 60 seconds for a given price. So what... Uh, what Patrick really wants is he wants his barrel of oil. So what happens at the end of the contract is a Jeep just has to give Patrick the money to buy his barrel of oil, what, whatever the price of the barrel of oil is going to be at the time. So instead of giving him the, the barrel, he's going to give him the, the money for the barrel at that time, or, or vice versa, right? So if the, price, uh, if the price of that barrel goes down, a Jeep just wants to sell his barrel for whatever price he contracted for. So what Patrick's going to do, he's going to send the, the, the difference and a, a, a deal will go, then go sell the barrel in the open market for the lower price, but Patrick, Patrick paid him the difference. So, so in this case, there's no underlying. Yes, Matt? Uh, have you thought about how you would do a margin call um, in these contracts, even if it's not the central clearing house? Excellent question. Um, so um, I'm going to let one of our financial experts take, take this one. <laughs> so the, so the, the question was what happens in the case of a margin call? OK. so. Um, when it comes to a margin call, I mean, we have a few options. Um, one option is that we could just close the contract, and that that's the safest way to go right now. Uh, but with Spritzel, um, we are assuming a scenario where we have a lot of liquidity in the market, or we have a lot of participants, so that would create a liquidity where we could go and roll over contracts. So that is the case, what we are taking right now. Yes, I, Rich. I had a question probably for Natalie. I, I just always bothered me. How are all these non-deliverable contracts not gambling? How is this legal? <laughs> right. So is that just um, the way it is, or? so there is more regulation. The uh, sorry. The, the question is for non-deliverable contracts. How are they legal, and how do they differ from gambling? So there is more regulation around non-deliverable contracts than deliverable contracts. 
and the CFTC has regulations on non-deliverables. Um, we have found a few exceptions, which we hope um, for certain use cases will be available to Spritzel. So is that classified as a bucketing shop right now? Because it's not deliverable? Um, I, I'm not um, sure if you... Oh, sorry. Uh, would that be a bucketing shop? And uh, I'm not sure if it would be because each contract is its own um, separate, I guess, entity or what, what we're thinking is uh, end, end use commercial uh, users, not financial users. Um, we're thinking of those uh, exceptions. How does this displace the depository trust company, the DPC? Um, I'm not sure exactly how that would replace them um, because the collateral is all within each individual contract. Um, but I'm not sure uh, where exactly they would be uh, playing into these. So the question is, uh, how would this replace DTCC, right? Um, so uh, DTCC actually what's has... What's the acronym again? <laughs> Sorry? What does that mean, DTCC? What's the acronym? So DTCC is basically the Depository Trust and Clearing House. Um, what is that? It's the <laughs> custodian of custodians. So finally, any, any trade that you do in the market right now uh, that goes between your brokers, it's finally actually going through DTCC at the end of it. So almost 90, 95% of the trades in US right now are going via DTCC. They are the final custodians. Um, so DTCC has two main uh, functions. One is um, who are the trusted entities and second is a clearing house. Um, when it comes to clearing house, I mean, that is uh, SEC regulation. So I think not, you would probably answer that better. But when it's a and trusted entity, I think the blockchain would take care of that. Will 100% of transactions uh, uh, settle in 12 seconds? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Will all the transactions, 100% of transactions settle in 12 seconds? Is that an average time or is that a, is that a worst case time? Oh, I see. So, so I think the question was, are all the transactions settled in 12 seconds? So essentially, I mean, what we saw here is that we, we, have, um, we have a block count up here, okay? And so when a transaction takes place on the, on the blockchain, on, on Ethereum, also on Bitcoin actually, uh, what, what happens is as soon as this transaction is broadcast to the network, uh, it gets queued up to be inserted into a certain block. Okay? Um, it's possible that not all currently pending transactions are going to be included in the next block. Okay? So if the network has a lot of transactions that are currently pending, then um, d depending on whoever is mining the next block, that node gets to decide which transactions to accept and that node gets paid a fee for those for those transactions. So the, the, the nodes are incentivized to accept as many transactions into the block as possible and Bitcoin has a block limit, um, a, a size on the, on the um, a limit on the size of each block. And so uh, I, I'm assuming it's the same case here in Ethereum. Um, so it, yes, it, it can happen that the transaction takes longer than 12 seconds. Um, in some cases, maybe, maybe much longer, but uh, I have a hard time imagining a scenario where it would take three days for one block to be mined, uh, for a transaction to be mined in, in, a, in a block. Um, maybe if the, the network were flooded with transactions and there just weren't enough miners. But, but the network is constructed in such a way that uh, when there's many transactions, it's going to incentivize more and more people to mine because they're going to get those transaction fees. And so very likely, you're going to see an average block time of 12 seconds. Any other questions? Okay. All right.